You know, off and on there are books and movements that talk about running the church like a business and refer to Jesus as something like the CEO of the entire operation. There was even not too long ago a book called Jesus CEO. But you know, personally, I'm not much for that language because if we look at the Gospels and at Acts and our lessons today even, Jesus doesn't seem to be exactly a business-minded individual. I mean, imagine that you're the owner of a small, successful, self-run, growing business. You're about to expand into a lucrative new market that will double or triple your territory and your audience. So naturally, the person you hire to head this part of the operation would be your worst enemy who's been working for the competition. That's what Jesus does. And alongside that, to keep him and the rest of the business going, you put in charge your former manager, an impulsive individual who has already abandoned you, denied you, and seems bent on returning to his former way of life. I mean, described this way, Jesus' business plan sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? That's because Jesus isn't in business. He's not a manager. He's the creator of the universe. He's so in love with creation, every bit of it, not just people, that he lays down his life for it. In John's gospel, Jesus walks resolutely and knowingly to his death. He's willing to suffer and die for you, for me, for Peter, for Paul, for all of creation. He calls into being a new order, a new kingdom, and is the firstborn of the citizens of that kingdom in resurrection. And in response to this redemption, the book of Revelation shows us all the creation, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, giving the Lamb of God their worship and praise. That's because Jesus is the only one worthy of our worship and praise. It's an amazing thing. The creator of all this knows us and loves us anyway. He thinks we're worthy of redemption, even though he knows us fully. This is definitely not a business plan. This is no sense in it. As a business plan, it would be doomed to failure. But as a new creation, it does so much more. You know, Pastor Craig last week told a great story about forgiveness, about a woman named Mary and her neighbor O'Shea. And he pointed out that first, Mary had no desire to forgive O'Shea, who was the killer of her only son. It took 12 long years for her to even think about forgiving him. And even then, she couldn't do it by her own work. When I think about forgiveness, I think about Corrie Ten Boom. Most of you may have heard of her. She was a very quiet Dutch woman, a walk, watchmaker by trade. She lived with her aging father and her sister in Harlem, Holland. And if Germany had never invaded the Netherlands in 1939, the world would never have known Corrie Ten Boom. Her fame wouldn't have spread outside her small city, where she would have been known as a woman of faith, who loved all of God's creatures and children, and she paid special attention to those who were mentally challenged in some way. And that is as far as her fame would have gotten. But instead, Corey and her sister Betsy and her father Casper filled their home with those who needed shelter from the Nazis. When they were found out and arrested early in 1944, they had helped dozens of people from resistance workers to the elderly and firm, the mentally and challenged. And at the time that they were arrested, they were sheltering six Jews in a hidden room that remained hidden even after they were arrested by the Nazis and those people were saved. But Corey and her sister and her, and her father were not. Her 84-year-old father died 10 days after his arrest in prison. But Corey and her sister spent 10 months in work camps and finally in Ravensbrück camp in Germany, where Betsy died just weeks before Corey was released. Before she died, Betsy told Corey about the vision she had, how they would be together after the war. There would be a beautiful house that would offer healing 
and love to all of those who survived the camps. And they would even take one of the camps themselves and turn it into a haven for Germans who needed to rebuild. Well, after the war, Corey did go back to Harlem, where a wealthy widow offered a mansion for her use and gave it to them for returned prisoners, mostly Dutch, some German, to come and heal. They raised vegetables and flowers in a garden, and they got to the point where they could start to start a new life, to forgive the terrible things that had happened to them during the war. Corey began to speak about her faith all over the Netherlands and all over Germany. And she spoke about the great God who had held her up and who had been with her. And she found some start to forgiving the things that had happened to her and to Betsy. But finally, one day, it happened. During a church service in Munich, afterwards, shaking hands with people, speaking with them, one of the people who came up was a guard at Ravenswood. She recognized him. He was free. He was there speaking with her. And that man was one she felt had her sister's blood on his hands. And she stood there. And he held out his hand to, to shake hers. And she couldn't move. She could not bring herself to put her hand out and touch this man. And so she prayed. She prayed desperately. She couldn't force herself to do it. So she said, Lord Jesus, forgive this man and use me to do this. She told Jesus that she just couldn't do this, and she asked for forgiveness from God for the fact that she couldn't do this. Jesus gave her that forgiveness, and slowly she felt her arm moving towards this man, and she was able to touch him. And when she touched him, she felt a love that she knew came from God. It couldn't come from her. And she writes about this incident so I discovered that it was not our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When Jesus tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. Let's face it, only the love of Jesus can help us forgive the unforgivable. We can't do it ourselves any more than Paul could have recovered his sight on his own. On our own, we're fishermen with empty nets, just like in Peter and the crew in today's gospel. Peter had already seen the angels at the tomb. He'd already seen Jesus appear to him. Even after these sightings, what does he do? He goes back to his original ways. He says, I'm going fishing. And most of the disciples say, well, we'll come with you. Jesus doesn't call him on that when he comes to him. Jake, can't you just hear that? Jesus calls him child, them children. He doesn't yell at them. He doesn't argue with them. Can't you hear the, the smile in his voice? You didn't catch any fish, did you? You went back to what you knew best instead of what I've shown you how to do, but you didn't catch any fish. Not until Jesus tells them where to cast their nets, and they do it, do they catch fish, and they catch lots of fish. Biblical scholars have debated about whether this 153 is some kind of magic number that means something, and nobody has any great word for it. It's just, as far as we know, it means a lot of fish, more than they could have been able to ca catch usually. The funny thing is that when they get to shore, Jesus doesn't even need the fish. He's already got fish of his own, cooking on the fire. The fish that he gives them as they cast their nets are a gift, a bounty, a look what we can do together. Here they are. And if you listen to that lesson, it's an echo of another time. Jesus blesses the food, breaks the bread, and they eat together. Sound familiar? Then he and Peter walk away down the shore and the hard stuff begins. 
Do you love me more than these? Jesus asks him. He asks once for every time that Peter has denied him and betrayed him, erasing all the hurt between them. But he isn't content with just hearing Peter say, yes, I love you. Each time, Jesus gives Peter an assignment. He gives him a new command, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Not only does he feed, does he forgive Peter, but he goes beyond forgiveness. If Jesus just forgave Peter, he could have just embraced him there on the sand and let him go, let him go back to fishing, and occasionally telling the story around a campfire or what, the, the time that I spent with the Messiah. But he does different things than that. Jesus tells Peter to do something very specific, to continue the work that he has begun. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he's told his people that. And here he is telling Peter, you're going to continue this work. You along with the others, but you are going to do this. It's not like he thinks Peter has changed a great deal. He just saw him charge ashore, anxious to be with Jesus so much that he couldn't even wait for the boat. He knows Peter is the same impulsive, reckless, but loving individual that he's always been. He doesn't give him any promises that he's called him to anything easy, just the right work. He lays out the future, telling Peter the way he's going to end up, and it's not going to be pleasant. When Jesus calls us, it isn't about false hope or pretty pictures. In today's lessons, we see more than once that people answering the call of Jesus aren't called to do easy tasks, or necessarily things they want to do. I mean, look at the previous lesson. When Jesus calls Ananias, Ananias starts arguing with him. He answers Jesus, but once he finds out what the Lord wants him to do, he says, whoa, this is, this is Saul. This is the greatest enemy of the church we're talking about. And you want me to lay hands on him and pray for him? I mean, Ananias is re understandably reluctant, but Jesus tells him, to do it anyway, and he does. I mean, imagine Saul and the shock that he's been in for three days before Ananias comes to him. Here he is, he's a learned Pharisee, bent on destroying these radicals who he has seen as destroyers of his faith, destroyers of Judaism. Then he's called by Jesus in a way that leaves him little doubt that Jesus is indeed the Messiah and the Son of God that the followers of the way say he is. Imagine him sitting there, blind, silent, not eating or drinking for three days, while he contemplates what he's been doing with his life in opposition to this Messiah. Think about what, where, what kind of place you would be in if this was, was you, how wrong he's been, what he's been doing against the real Messiah. But then Ananias comes, and suddenly he can see again. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he's baptized even before he eats anything after fasting for three days. He doesn't waste any time after that either. This new man, this new Paul, goes to the very synagogues in Damascus that he would have the old Saul would have been hauling people out of to take to Jerusalem under arrest, and he proclaims Jesus as the Son of God. So what does that mean for us? Does Jesus call each of us to dramatic work like Peter and Paul? No. But he does call each of us to work. We're called, whether we're called to feed the flock or make sandwiches for homeless people, Jesus is calling you to do something. We are each created to fill a spot in the kingdom. I can't fill yours, you can't fill mine. When Jesus called us, calls us, we are covered in grace by the Holy Spirit and given the right tools for the job that we are called to do. Jesus doesn't just forgive us and set us free. He forgives us and sets us free to do something. And that something may be familiar, or it may be something totally new and incredibly challenging. 
As Luther reminds us in, our small, in his small catechism, not for man, you probably know this, we are generously forgiven, called, gathered, and enlightened, and made holy to be the people of God. Jesus calls you, is calling you, and now it's your turn to answer. What are you going to say? Amen. <laughs>